Joining you this week is visiting from Baylor College of Medicine, where he is currently an associate professor in the departments of pediatrics and molecular and human genetics. He received his Bachelor of Science in Physics from Virginia Polytechnic Institute and in State University, and his PhD in Human Nutrition from Cornell University in New York. After, he spent his postdoc in molecular genetics for four years at Duke University Medical Center in the Department of Radiation Oncology in North Carolina. There, he worked as a fellow at the Dannon Institute in Interdisciplinary Nutrition Science. Since then, he has become very successful with over 40 peer-reviewed publications, along with earning many awards, such as the Nick Hales Award in 2009 from the International Society for Developmental Origin of Health and Disease, and the Lucille S. Hurley Distinguished Lecture Award from the Department of Nutrition at University of California, Davis, last year. He also holds positions as council member in the International Society for Developmental Origins of Health and Disease and a board member of the Epigenetic Society. Today, our speaker will be discussing his topic, Early Nutritional Influences on Human Developmental, uh, developmental Epigenetics. So please join me in welcoming our guest, Dr. Robert Waterland. Okay, well, thank you very much for that nice introduction. It's a pleasure to be here. And I'd just like to emphasize that if uh, at any time during my talk, if you have questions, please you know, raise your hands, uh, get my attention. I don't, want, I don't want anybody to be left behind. I'd like to start today by, by acknowledging the people in my laboratory who are uh, helping with these projects and, and also my collaborators. Um, in particular, on the work I'll be discussing uh, with you today, uh, 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 the lion's share of the um, high throughput um, DNA methylation analyses that we're, we've been uh, doing uh, were conducted by Ella Loritsky, who is a, a research assistant in my lab. Also, these studies uh, could not could not be completed with a, without a lot of bioinformatics support. And in that regard, uh, we've been very fortunate in the last year or so to have uh, Noah Kessler on board. He's actually an undergraduate. Well, he's a a senior at U of H this year, and uh, he is just a fantastic computer programmer, and, and he's been learning a lot about bioinformatics, uh, working with us, and uh, really bringing a lot to the table. Also, key collaborators on this work include Lan Lan Shen, Grant Guan, and Christy Korfa at, at Baylor, as well as Andrew Prentice and his colleagues at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine in London. All right, so this, this is what we're going to be talking about today, is the, the miracle of human development. So I just, I just want all of you to reflect for a moment and, and think about the fact that, that every single one of us in this room started out as, as this single cell, this, the fertilized egg. And it's just incredible, right, to think about that within this single cell are the genetic instructions required to, to build this, this fantastic and, and complex organism, uh, you. Uh, and, and yet, the, the, the DNA is, is not enough to make this happen, right? Uh, clearly, this does not happen in a vacuum. Rather, environmental influences are critical throughout various stages of this process, from, from maternal factors carried in the cytoplasm, cytoplasm of the egg, to the biochemical composition of the oviduct fluid that bathes the early embryo, and of course, following placentation, to uh, nutrients and, and various cofactors that are provided by the maternal circulation. So, uh, and that, that to me is really what, uh, what fascinates me about, about epigenetics is it, it provides a, uh, a potential window uh, into understanding how environment influences genome regulation for a lifetime. And that's, that's what I'm really focused on today. And the, the story begins with these two mice. These are, these are two uh, newborn genetically identical agouti viable yellow or AVY heterozygous mice. Uh, and, and as I mentioned, they're, they're genetically identical and they, they appear identical uh, as well. And yet, be, because of an epigenetic difference at the agouti viable yellow or AVY locus, uh, this, this mouse will grow up to be yellow and obese, and this one will grow up to be lean and brown, as shown right here. And, and you, can, you can tell they're the, the same two mice uh, because they, they even pose the same way. <laughs> and, okay, so 
in, in particular, this, this mouse has a very low level of DNA methylation at AVY, and her sister has a very high level of DNA methylation. And alleles that behave this way, where you can, where you can have uh, stochastic or, or you know, probabilistic establishment of very different uh, epigenetic states, even among isogenic uh, animals, are called metastable epi alleles. And we and others have shown that the stochastic process of, of establishment of DNA methylation at metastable epi alleles is influenced by maternal nutrition and other environmental factors during development. All right? But what, what also makes these very, very interesting and, and, and important to study is that the, the inter-individual variation in DNA methylation at these loci occurs systemically. It's the same in, in essentially all tissues. All right, so cons consequently, I could have taken a drop of blood from each of these newborn mice, and by measuring DNA methylation at ABY, I could have predicted with absolute certainty which mouse would become obese. All right, so if you think, if you think about that, you know, hopefully you can see the parallels to how this might relate to humans and being able to, uh, to do uh, you know, um, disease prediction and that sort of thing epigenetically in humans. And that's, that's what I'm going to be talking about today. All right, so my, my interest in epigenetics stems from the developmental origins paradigm, which was described here in this Newsweek cover story in 1999, where health begins, uh, obesity, cancer, and heart attacks, how your odds are set in the womb. And so this is referring to the developmental origins hypothesis, which, which proposes that um, during, during critical periods of development, transient environmental stimuli can, can perturb developmental pathways and thereby cause permanent changes in gene expression, metabolism, and, and risk of disease. And of, of um, various potential mechanisms that, uh, that Cudberto Garza and I proposed to potentially underlie the, the persistence of, of these effects. I have been studying, uh, you know, ever, ever since then, I've been focused on the potential for this to occur by induced alterations in epigenetic gene regulation. Uh, so um, epigenetics refers to the study of mitotically heritable alterations in gene expression potential that are not caused by changes in DNA sequence. And, and, the, and the best example of epigenetics at work is to think of, of tissue specific and cell type specific gene expression because you know all, all these different cell types shown here have, have the exact same DNA the entire human genome and yet they express very different subsets of genes so the the uh, mechanisms that are established during early development during differentiation and then maintained uh, you know through, even throughout the successive rounds of mitosis and, and, and stem cell uh, proliferation and this sort of thing to to perpetuate these cell type specific patterns of gene expression potential are epigenetic mechanisms and, and another way to think about it is that epigenetics literally means above genetics so these these are gene regulatory mechanisms that are layered on top of the dna sequence information uh, so what what are these well there's um cytosine methylation uh, which i'll be telling you about more about shortly also, various modifications to the, the histone proteins that, that package DNA into these uh, nucleosomes in, in the nucleus are, are widely viewed as epigenetic. And yet, uh, as, as Hennikoff and Schlatterfard and, and other people have been pointing out recently, that it still remains unclear whether, um, whether histone modifications themselves actually have this definitive characteristic, this def definitive ability to be able to convey information through mitosis. So it remains unclear whether they are uh, bona fide epigenetic mechanisms. On, on the other hand, autoregulatory transcription factors, transcription factors that bind to and transactivate their own promoters, uh, do, do have a, a bona fide mechanism for conveying information through, through mitosis and in, by this feed forward autoregulation. Um, but they, they gain relatively little study these days. Uh, and also, of course, non-coding RNA. But um, these and potentially other mechanisms work in a synergistic fashion to maintain different regions of chromatin in either a uh, more transcriptionally inactive state or a more open and transcriptionally competent state. And this is done in, in a cell type specific fashion. All right, so in, in my lab, we focus on DNA methylation. So I'll tell you a little bit more about that. 
most cytosines within within a CPG dinucleotides, that's a C followed by a G in your genome, are methylated at the number five position, converting cytosine to five methylcytosine. And this, this covalent modification alters gene expression potential by affecting the affinity of methylation sensitive DNA binding proteins. Now, uh, tissue specific patterns of CPG methylation are established during development. And the way, the way that works is the um, shortly after fertilization. So this shows methylation, global methylation levels versus developmental time. What you can see is uh, shortly after fertilization, uh, the vast majority of methylation in both the sperm and the egg genome is erased. And then right around the time of implantation, you have a, a lineage specific and cell type specific uh, establishment of appropriate methylation patterns for those, for those cell types. So this is a, an integral part of the differentiation process. All right, and as, as a nutritionist, I'm interested in DNA methylation because the methylation process requires uh, dietary methyl donors and cofactors. As shown right here in this, in this cartoon of mammalian one carbon metabolism, you can see that many, many uh, nutrients such as uh, folate, shown here as 5-methyltetrahydrofolate, vitamin B12, betaine, choline, vitamin B6, methionine, these and, and other nutrients play critical roles in ensuring the flow of methyl groups that are required for DNA methylation. So it's, it's intuitive that at either deficiencies or excesses of these nutrients at, uh, at these critical periods of development when DNA methylation is being established could affect this process. And, and, and lastly, and very importantly, we understand the mechanism of mitotic heritability uh, of DNA methylation patterns. So once established, during development, these are highly stable over, over decades within differentiated cell types. And that, that stability really relates to the, uh, to the CPG dinucleotide. And the, the key about CPGs is that a, a, a CG in this direction is, is also a CG in this direction. So these are, this is a pal palindromic dinucleotide. And when you have methylation on one CPG, that's a signal for the other strand to be methylated as well. And so that's really, that's really the, the fundamental basis for the semi-conservative maintenance of established patterns of CPG methylation. So really, 5-methylcytosine could, could be viewed as the fifth base in our genome. And, uh, and, and, but unlike, uh, you know, unlike the other four bases, the, um, the establishment of, uh, of methylation on, on cytosines is uh, influenced by environment and other other uh, influences during development, as I'll be showing you. All right, so with that background, I can tell you a little bit more about these agouti viable yellow or AVY mice. Um, the the agouti gene in mice encodes the encodes a paracrine signaling molecule that regulates the production of a yellow pigment in fur, and agouti is normally only expressed during a, a transient stage of hair growth, and this leads to a yellow band on the otherwise black hair, which causes uh, the, the brown coat color of a normal wild-type mouse. Now, in, in the, these ADY mice, a retrotransposon, uh, it's an IAP, it stands for an intrasystonal A particle, has inserted itself upstream of the agouti locus and causes both a, a genetic and an epigenetic dysregulation of the locus. The, the genetic dysregulation, what I, mean, what I mean by that is that it this IAP induces a cryptic promoter, uh, which drives agouti expression, uh, ectopic agouti expression. So agouti is being expressed all over the body all the time, leading to a yellow coat color, as you might as you might imagine. But also, um, interestingly, because because agouti protein binds antagonistically to the melanocortin four receptor in the hypothalamus, um, the ectopic agouti expression also causes hyperphagic obesity. Now, the, the epigenetic dysregulation is what I find most interesting. And what, what I mean by that is that for, for some reason that we don't quite understand, the presence of this IAP element upstream of the agouti locus causes a complete dysregulation of um, establishment of DNA methylation at the locus, such that within, within a single litter of AVY heterozygous mice, you can have some with a very... Uh, with a very low level of methylation and leading to the, the yellow coat color and other, other phenotypic effects. 
and you can have other mice with a very high degree of methylation, which uh, essentially normalizes the phenotype of the mouse and makes it appear like a, a normal wild type mouse. And, and you can have everything in between. Now, uh, back in 1998, um, George Wolf and his colleagues published a, a study where they, they did a simple experiment supplementing the diets of female mice with various methyl donors and cofactors before and during pregnancy and showed that they were able to shift the coat color of their AVY heterozygous mice toward the brown uh, phenotype, suggesting, of course, that, that they were inducing hypermethylation in, in the offspring. But, but several years went by and nobody tested that, so that's what, um, that's what I did as a uh, postdoc with Randy Jurdle at Duke. So we, we replicated the, the findings of Wolf et al. Um, and this, this is shown here in, in 10 litters of uh, 10 litters born to supplemented and unsupplemented dams. We can see that the methyl donor supplement with which, which uh, consisted of uh, uh, folic acid, vitamin B12, betaine, and choline, that this shifted the coat color distribution toward this brown uh, phenotype. But also, uh, unlike uh, Wolf et al., additionally, we measured DNA methylation at the AVY locus, as shown here. And, and the way we did that, I'll, I'll just um, explain, is uh, using bisulfite sequencing. And the, the way bisulfite sequencing works is that when you treat DNA with sodium bisulfite under the right conditions, you deaminate cytosines to uracil. But, but methylated cytosines are protected from that deamination. So following the bisulfite conversion, we, we can do a, a PCR reaction through a specific region of interest, uh, following which the unmethylated cytosines are all converted to Ts in the sequence, whereas the, the, the methylated cytosines remain as Cs in the sequence. And we can use various quantitative um, sequencing methods to, uh, to estimate the proportion of C to T and get a very precise measurement of, of methylation at, at the um, individual CPG sites. And that's what's, that's what's shown here is that in, in the offspring of, uh, you know, in, in the offspring of supplemented dams versus the unsupplemented dams, we had this very profound increase in DNA methylation at the AVY locus. And, and this increase was, uh, was found in essentially all, in, in all the tissues that we looked at and was permanent. So this, you know, this was important because this was the first demonstration that um, that maternal nutrition could cause a phenotypic change in the offspring via an epigenetic mechanism. And, and it also highlighted the potential involvement of metastable epi alleles in these processes in general. All right, so I've, I've used this term a couple of times, metastable epi allele or, or ME. Uh, it was, it's a term def that was proposed by Emma Whitelaw's group over 10 years ago to describe an allele at which the epigenetic state can switch and establish establishment is a probabilistic event. Once established, the state is mitotically inherited. So, th so the key, um, there's two key components to this definition is that once in each individual's life in the very early embryo, there's a completely random establishment of the epigenetic state at these loci. Uh, but but following that establishment, uh, the state is maintained and perpetuated for the rest of that individual's life in, in all the various tissues. All right. And in this paper, Racky and et al. Uh, essentially described you know, the AVY mouse and also the Axe-infused mouse as two of the, the best examples of murine metastable epi allele. So this, this got me more interested in the Axe-infused mouse. So Axe infused is another IAP associated metastable epi allele. In this case, the IAP is, has inserted itself into intron six of the Axon gene rather than upstream of the uh, the Agouti gene. And Axon is a uh, is a regulator of embryonic axis formation. And for some, you know, and and, and this IAP similar to an AVY, it induces a cryptic promoter downstream of the IAP. Uh, and this drives a three prime truncated transcript of axon. And this and this is this truncated transcript that appears to have biological activity and, is, and causes the phenotype. But the, the, the phenotypic readout in this case of the most visible phenotype is a kinky tail phenotype. All right, so this, this picture shows two axon fused heterozygous mice. They're genetically identical. Uh, this mouse with a low level of, uh, with, with low methylation at axon fused 
has a kinky tail phenotype. Uh, his brother here with, with high methylation has a normal tail phenotype. So give, given all the similarities between you know, the AVY mouse and the Axe infused mouse, we set out to test the hypothesis that we could use the same uh, maternal methyl donor supplementation paradigm to reduce either the severity or the incidence of tail kinking uh, in these uh, Axe infused mice. Uh, so, so to do that, we used essentially the same paradigm as before. Um, we we had we used the same two diets, which was you know this this uh, natural ingredient control diet or that diet supplemented with folic acid, B12, betaine, and choline. Uh, we we rated the offspring for tail phenotype at 21 days of age, as shown here. Uh, so we had you know un unaffected mice, uh, slightly kinky mice with at least one tail kink of less than 45 degrees. Uh, kinky was having at least one kink with at least 45 degrees. And <laughs> Ow. Uh, so very kinky. It's, you know, you kind of, you know it when you see it. You know what I mean? Um, okay, and, and so, so in, in addition to rating the tail, the tail phenotype, we also measured DNA methylation in the accent, at the axon-fused locus by bisulfite sequencing. So did, um, did the methyl donor supplementation to the dams reduce the incidence of tail kinking in the offspring? Yes, yes it did, as shown right here. And the easiest way to see this, so this shows all of the offspring, all of the axon-fused heterozygous offspring born to around 20 liters each of, of control and supplemented dams. And uh, what you can see is, you know, very obviously, if you look right here, that there is about a, uh, this, just, just giving this supplement to the, to the mothers basically doubled the, um, uh, the proportion of the offspring that were completely unaffected by tail kinking. And this, this was highly significant. And did this occur by an increase in methylation at the locus? Uh, yes, yes, it did. And I'll, I'll have you focus over here on the right-hand side first. What, what we did first is to look at the overall methylation of, of all the pups that were in the study. We looked at methylation at axe infused uh, versus the tail phenotype. And as expected, you can see this, this nice association. It's not, nowhere near as neat as what we saw in the ADY model, but clearly uh, higher methylation is protective against tail kink. And in particular, what you'll note is that out of the 57 mice that were unaffected with any tail kinks, Almost all of them had a, a methylation, percent methylation above 80%. So there appears to be some kind of a threshold there. And that's relevant when you look over here at the, the DNA methylation in the, the supplemented versus the control mice. Uh, this, this median here, the median methylation only went up from around 60% to around 80%. So it wasn't, wasn't a huge increase. However, because, you know, because of this threshold effect here uh, at 80%, this, this relatively modest increase was enough to completely explain the reduction in tail kinking that we saw. All right, so that's, I, I think this is a really nice example of how, um, you know, even relatively modest effects can, I mean, because remember, this was a, a basically a, a doubling of the number of unaffected mice caused by this, only this 20% increase in methylation. So clearly it, it underscores the importance of measuring uh, epigenetic mechanisms in a quantitative fashion. Okay, so our, our two studies, as well as another study by Randy Jurdles Group, uh, together they, um, they lead to the, the overall conclusion that, there's, that at metastable epi alleles, uh, that, that these loci are particularly vulnerable to uh, maternal nutritional and other environmental influences on the establishment of epigenotype. And that leads to the question of, you know, do, do these metastable epi alleles exist in humans? And are there, are there similar types of effects happening in humans where mom's nutrition is affecting the establishment of DNA methylation? And, and in, um, what, I, what I want to point out is that there are, you know, many, many people are getting very interested in, in understanding to what extent epigenetic dysregulation contributes to human disease. It's becoming a hot field. 
and and yet there are there are many obstacles to uh, to really understanding to answering this question. And and I'll just underscore some of those here. Now, now first of all, for example, genetic variation influences epigenetic variation. And and for this reason, for example, if we take, I mean, there you could go out and do you know there are people doing epigenome wide association studies uh, between let's say uh, lean and obese individuals, and you know almost certainly you can find epigenetic differences between two groups of individuals, but it's very, very difficult to rule out that the, the, the epigenetic differences as well as the, the differences in uh, you know, uh, obesity, et cetera, are not all due to underlying genetic variation. So that's, that's, a, that's a, a complexity that we have to deal with. Also, epigenetic regulation is, is inherently tissue specific. For, you know, the vast majority of epigenetic regulation is tissue specific. So you have, um, you know, un unlike genetic epidemiology where you can take a DNA sample from, from any easily obtainable tissue like peripheral blood, a buccal swab, etc. cetera, in, in most cases, depending on, the, on, depending on the disease you're interested in, in most cases, epigenetic marks in peripheral blood won't be particularly informative uh, to give you insight into epigenetic dysregulation in your specific uh, tissue or cell types of interest. And, and also, the disease process itself can affect epigenetic mechanisms. And this, this is something that is um, most recognized in the field of cancer epigenetics, which, you know, where we've known for decades that tumors are characterized by a widespread epigenomic dysregulation. There's, there's hypermethylation in some regions and hypomethylation in other regions, and yet uh, until until just recently, until a study that uh, that was published by my colleague uh, Lan Lan Shen at Baylor, uh, it was unclear whether epigenetic dysregulation itself could cause cancer. All right, so all all of these you know are, are some of the key obstacles to really understanding whether uh, epigenetic dysregulation alone can cause disease. But what I what I want to point out is that the characteristics of metastable epithelials actually address or, or allow us to uh, circumvent many of these obstacles in, in a particular subset of genomic loci. Because of the fact that you know, at, at metastable epithelials, we have the, the inter-individual variation in DNA methylation occurs stochastically. It's not due to genetic differences. Also, as I described before, uh, the inter-individual variation in DNA methylation is, occurs systemically. It's not tissue specific. And very importantly, we know that uh, the epigenetic state at these loci is established in the very early embryo. So this gives us information on temporality, which can help us in drawing causal inferences. All right, so with, with this in mind, we've, we've been setting out to identify human metastable epithelials. And the way we did that is we, we set up a screen where we looked for inter-individual differences in DNA methylation that are, that are the same in two different tissues derived from different germ layers of the early embryo. So we, um, we looked at peripheral blood lymphocytes and hair follicle uh, from eight healthy adults, and we, we used a technique called methylation-specific amplification microarray, which I could, I could tell you more about later if you want. But essentially, th what this allows us to do is a genome-scale screen for methylation differences. And we did, uh, we did four different inter-individual co-hybridizations comparing the same two individuals in both peripheral blood and hair follicle. And in this way, allowing us to look for differences that are the same in both tissues. And by this approach, we identified around 40, and around 40 uh, candidate metastable epithelials. And we, we validated these MEs in, in multiple ways. The first was to confirm systemic inter-individual variation in DNA methylation. And to do that, you know, e even though we, uh, we set up the screen in Caucasians, we actually obtained cadaver tissues from Vietnamese individuals and were able to uh, look at methylation across uh, liver, kidney, and brain, representing the three germ layers of the early embryo. And uh, as you would expect, if you, if you have systemic inter-individual variation, then when you plot, for example, kidney versus liver, or brain versus liver, or brain versus kidney, 
you get a nice you get a nice correlation as shown here. So here's here's some examples in which we were able to validate this uh, that you know so this this screen which focused on peripheral blood and hair follicle was able to pull out regions that show that indeed show systemic inter individual variation in DNA methylation. And secondly, we wanted to test whether you know this really is stochastic. In other words, it's not genetically mediated. And to, to look at that, we studied monozygotic twins. Uh, and as you can see, uh, these, this shows uh, some two examples. Uh, we have twin B versus twin A percent methylation. Uh, and you can see that there's a, a lot of variation. Uh, you know, there's, here you have a, a, a modest correlation. Uh, at ZNF678, no correlation at all. But in any event, you can see a lot of scatter, even among genetically identical individuals. And in each case, we picked out a, uh, w one of these outliers to look at to study by clonal bisulfite sequencing. And, and the way this works is that we, uh, following the, uh, the, the bisulfite modification and then PCR, then we can take the PCR product and subclone it into bacteria. And what uh, then you can sequence each individual clone. And each, individ each individual clone then represents one molecule that was in the PCR product. And in this way, you get a molecule by molecule representation of, of, of what the DNA patterns look like. And so this is pretty striking, I think, that you know, here's, here's two genetically identical individuals, and here's another two genetically identical individuals. And you can see that not only, are the, uh, not only is the extent of methylation very different in these two uh, people, uh, in, in both of these regions, but the, even the pattern of site-specific CPG methylation is very different. All right, so this, this answered, you know, the, basically two of the definitive criteria, you know, that we have is that we have this systemic inter-individual variation in DNA methylation. It's not genetically mediated. It, it occurs stochastically. And then the last, the last question is, is this influenced by maternal nutrition before and during conception? And to, uh, to study that, I teamed up with my friend, Andrew Prentice, um, who's been working in, uh, in the Gambia, West Africa, for about the last 30 years to study uh, seasonal effects on, uh, on maternal nutrition and reproductive outcomes. And this, this shows us right after a swim in the, uh, the, the Bitang Bolan uh, River uh, just this past summer. And the, thankfully, the, the crocodiles weren't very interested in us maybe for obvious reasons. <laughs> anyway, just to, just to orient you, this is, this is a view of uh, Keneba, the Gambia, during the rainy season. And this is a view during the dry season. And in, in both cases, you can see the, the soccer field uh, in slightly different orientations. But um, this, this dramatic seasonal variation, you know, because these, uh, these villagers are subsistence farmers, uh, this dramatic seasonal variation of, you know, has a big impact on, on nutritional status uh, and energy expenditure of these, of these villagers. In particular, uh, the rainy season is actually considered the hungry season because the villagers are engaged in a lot of agricultural work and at the same time they're running out of the staple crops the har from the previous harvest. Uh, whereas in the, in the dry season, they have uh, more food stores and there's less work to do. And this, um, this seasonal variation affects everyone in these villages, in, including women, and in particular women, because women are the ones who are doing most of the farming work uh, in, in these uh, societies. And as, as a result, as, as Andrew Prentice and, and, and other groups have shown over the last, over the last decades, that this seasonality results in, in a reproducible uh, effects on uh, birth outcomes. For example, small for gestational age and preterm birth instances are both higher in, uh, in children born during the rainy season than during the dry season. But of course, we, we were interested in things not, not happening around the time of birth, but rather around the time of conception. So, so we designed a study to ask whether season of conception in rural Gambia uh, affects DNA methylation at these metastable epileles we identified. To do that, we, we did this, uh, we did the first study retrospectively. We obtained peripheral blood DNA from um, children 
uh, average age around seven years who were conceived uh, during either the peak of the rainy or the, the dry season. Uh, and we did this across four different uh, years of conception. And, and this is a relatively small study of only about uh, only 25 per season, 25 children per season of conception. And remember that based on our mouse studies, we anticipated that individuals who are conceived in the nutritionally challenged rainy season would have would have a lower level of DNA methylation at their metastable epithelial needles. And actually, we found the exact opposite. We found that at, at all five of these ME loci that we looked at, there was slightly higher DNA methylation in children who were conceived during the, the rainy season. Uh, and, and you can see that in, in, in every case, we can just focus right here, for example, in every case, there's a broad distribution of methylation values, even within each season. Um, there's a lot of inter individual variation, as you, as you would expect with a stochastic establishment of, of methylation state. However, in, in each case, being conceived in the rainy season just nudged this distribution upward just a bit. All right, so uh, of course, this was a relatively small study. And um, there was, you know, you know, since we did this retrospectively, it's, it's tough to say that indeed it was maternal nutrition that, that caused uh, this difference. I mean, there, there could be other seasonal, seasonally variable parameters that could have affected methylation. And also, since we only looked in, in one tissue, this was in peripheral blood, it's, you know, it's tough. We, we can't really say that, that this is a systemic effect. All right, so for all those reasons, we, yes, you have a question? I, I'm just wondering, I mean, the rainy season is a lot greener than the brown. So while energy may be quite limiting during the rainy season, it's folate and methyl donors availability. I mean, are they eating fresh greens that have more folate and whatnot? Did you read my papers? I think you did. Uh, I read uh, the abstract. Uh, okay, okay. Right. Yeah, you're on. You're, so yes, that's... Um, and that's a that's a perfect lead into the, the the next study for you know for all for all the reasons that I just described we uh, we wanted to conduct a stronger study and that's and that's what we did next is to conduct a prospective study in this in this population and uh, and and the goal here was to actually be able to measure uh, maternal nutritional status early in pregnancy uh, and be able to relate that to uh, DNA methylation at these metastable epithelials in in the offspring. And, and even though I'm not emphasizing it here, we, in addition to measuring uh, uh, maternal nutritional status biomarkers in peripheral blood, we also did a lot of work on um, trying to assess food intake and, and what, what types of food they were eating in, in different seasons. And uh, in, indeed, there was, there was a link with green, more green leafy vegetables being eaten in the rainy season than during the dry season. Um, and, and, and I should mention too that all of this work, this, this big prospective study was conducted, it was the PhD um, thesis of Paula Dominguez Salas. Um, all right, so what, what we did was focused on uh, across 34 villages in this region, uh, West Kiang, the Gambia. Um, over 2,000 women of reproductive age were enrolled in the study, and they were visited monthly by health workers. And uh, at, at the report of the first missed period, uh, each woman uh, had a, a peripheral blood sample taken, and then she would, she would be visited uh, a month later, and at that time, if she still hadn't had a period, then they would, you know, she was enrolled into the study, and uh, the blood sample was sent for analysis. And in this way, we were able to uh, collect maternal blood and, and get all these biomarkers measured at around eight weeks of gestation. Um, and then subsequently, um, we collected peripheral blood and hair follicle DNA from the infants uh, at around uh, six months of age to measure methylation state at these metastable epithelials. And in this way, we were able to, able to obtain complete data from around 68 infants uh, conceived per season. Also, at, at, during the exact same year, so this was all done during one calendar year, and during, that, during the exact same year, in addition to the main group, we uh, studied an indicator group who were 30 women of reproductive age who uh, had food intake and their blood biomarkers measured uh, monthly. And we, we used the biomarker data of the indicator group uh, to be able to kind of to back extrapolate 
the data from the main group back to the approximate time of conception. And that's how we were able to, to really estimate maternal nutritional status at the time of conception. Okay, and just to give, I mean, just to put this in perspective for you, I like, I like to show this slide. This shows all of the different villages participate, uh, you know, where there were women participating in this study. Uh, and you can see this is uh, an area of several hundred square miles. Uh, and these, you know, these lines between the villages uh, can, it, you know, it's, it's very generous to call them roads. Uh, and, and during the rainy season, they, they just turn into, uh, you know, muddy, muddy tracks. And so it, if you can try to imagine the complexity of of doing this type of study where you're collecting these samples and you need to keep them on ice and you need to get everything to the laboratory for processing and all this sort of thing. So it really uh, is just amazing that, that things worked out as, as well as they did. All right, and oh, and this, this just shows the all of the different, so we measured 13 different um, plasma biomarkers as shown here. So it's essentially almost everything you could think of measuring that uh, relating to one carbon metabolism was assessed in these women. Uh, and this was done in collaboration with Sheila Innes and Steve Zizel. All right, so the first question is, did we, did we replicate our previous findings? Did we see that, that children who were conceived in the rainy season had higher level of, of DNA methylation at these MEs? And indeed, um, we did. You can see that you know, it's, uh, it's, not a very, it's not a huge effect. So th these are six different metastable epi alleles that we looked at. You can see that in every case that individuals conceived in the rainy season had a slightly higher DNA methylation. And the overall pattern is highly significant in peripheral blood. And in hair follicle, we found es essentially the exact same thing, the exact same pattern, uh, and, and also a significant increase in, in methylation. So this, this is very important because this, this shows that this effect of being conceived in the rainy season essentially is affecting all the tissues, all the cell types in the body, right? So this is, this is consistent then with a, an effect that is occurring very, very early in conception and in, in during the early, in, uh, very early in embryonic development. Okay, and, and by, because of the fact by, that we measured these 13 biomarkers prospectively, we were able to ask whether maternal nutritional status around the time of conception predicted DNA methylation marks in her infant over a year later. And uh, we can see that they did. In particular, the best predictors uh, that predicted, uh, the best biomarkers that predicted DNA methylation in the infant, both in peripheral blood and in hair follicle, were homocysteine and cysteine. And in both cases, Elevated homocysteine or elevated cysteine in the mother around the time of conception predicted lower DNA methylation in, in her infant at these metastable epialleles. And that's really interesting because in, in terms of, uh, you know, looking at how nutritional biomarkers uh, might influence DNA methylation processes, there's been a lot of, a lot of focus more on the supply side, uh, looking at things like methionine and, and folate. Whereas what, what our results show is that, at least in terms of, uh, of predicting um, methylation, you know, methylation status in, or, or methylation flux in, uh, at a metastable epiallele in the early embryo, that rather it's, the, uh, it's the, the product side or the, you know, the byproduct side of these methylation reactions. Homocysteine and cysteine, which are byproducts of, of DNA methylation, uh, are the best indicators of methylation potential. In the uh, in the early embryo. <coughs> okay, so um, ho hopefully I've convinced you that that epigenetic metastability is is not just something that occurs in uh, in in these yellow mice or these kinky tail mice, but actually this is also something that is happening in humans. All right, so there are certain regions of the genome that undergo stochastic establishment of DNA methylation, and this, this process can be influenced by maternal nutrition before and during pregnancy. And, uh, you know, the way we're looking at this is, you know, rather than affecting things like coat color or tail kinkiness, that uh, we, we believe, in fact, we, we, we have found some metastable epialleles that uh, are actually implicated in human disease. And so that, uh, you know, we're very, you know, because of the reasons that, reasons that I showed you of the, you know, the nice features of metastable epialleles,
uh, study epigenetic dysregulation and human disease, we really believe that uh, that identifying and characterizing more human metastable epi alleles is going to help us gain great insights into how epigenetic dysregulation uh, contributes to human disease. All right, and so I just uh, I just want to leave you with this picture in your mind is just that you know to think about the fact that these two genetically identical sisters differ uh, most most fundamentally in the, the in the degree of methylation at the AVY locus. All right, so I, I would ask you which you know which of these two individuals do you identify with more? And you know we're all used to thinking that that all inter-individual phenotypic variation is is due to genetic differences, but uh, clearly I hope you'll agree that we need to understand to what extent epigenetic differences are also contributing to our phenotype. All right, thank you. Oh, can I have your hair follicles? <laughs> yeah, that, that's a great question. And um, the 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 key is that I mean the reason that we would ex still expect to see differences even among monozygotic twins is that even even if all of the environmental influences, all of the maternal nutrition, all that sort of thing are the exact same, you would still have, you know, random differences at these regions, at metastable epi alleles. And uh, so that's, you know, that's the, you know, so, and, I, and I showed some examples of that, how even within MZ twins, you can have very different methylation states at these regions, at these regions. And uh, so, yeah, but that's, I mean, that clearly we're, we're very interested in, uh, in studying more MZ twins, and, and in particular, as I as I uh, as I was I was kind of joking, but uh, but in, in I mean actually, the, most people most of the samples that people have from MZ twins from as far as DNA is peripheral blood, and uh, and some some studies from Ros Rosanna Wexberg and his and her colleagues have shown that peripheral blood may be the exact wrong uh, tissue to look at in in order to try to understand epigenetic differences between monozygotic twins because of the fact that uh, you know in during during the um, twin development you can have some sharing of the hematopoietic stem cells uh, in the in the circulation and so actually that um, the you even though twins might even though MZ twins might be very different epigenetically uh, that in the blood cells you might find, you know, very little differences. So that's why we're that we're currently looking into uh, looking at other tissues such as hair follicle uh, in MZ twin pairs. Yes. Okay. <coughs> I'm curious about um, whether you think it's necessary to identify the most um, susceptible period of to this kind of imprinting? And maybe it's a dumb question, but why do you think it's that conception rather than one week gestation or two weeks gestation? Okay, it's, it's not a dumb question at all. Actually, I mean, so, I mean, you talked about different potential critical windows for these uh, environmental influences on developmental epigenetics. And I, and I don't mean to, I don't mean to imply that, that everything is happening right in the early embryo. Rather, there's, uh, you know, there's, Many different developmental processes, you know, epigenetic development is continuing even during late fetal development and even into postnatal life. So, and you know, so these, there, you know, these all would constitute different potential critical windows when environmental influences could, it, could affect these. You would think it would, it might matter by tissue, but you're saying that epi, you know, epi, the, the, the alleles that you're looking at, it shouldn't matter by tissue. So it doesn't. So, for example, there are some tissues that d develop postnatally, right? Right, of course. Right. So, the, I'm wondering how you feel about those. I I like those too. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, for, for for example, in 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 other research that I didn't discuss today, we are looking at at uh, epigenetic development in the hypothalamus in mice and, and how this relates to establishment of body weight regulation 
and and we we published a paper earlier this year where we showed that in uh, during the early postnatal period in the mouse there is dramatic epigenetic development in the hypothalamus specifically specifically in neurons in the hypothalamus and uh, so this you know we, we believe is a, another time period and indeed many you know many studies over the, over the last several decades have shown that early postnatal nutrition can have a, uh, a permanent impact on body weight regulation and other other outcomes uh, in adulthood in, in rodents and so we're exploring the hypothesis that uh, that this is occurring at least in part by uh, by alterations in, in epigenetic uh, regulation in, in the hypothalamus, you know, although it could be in, in other brain regions as well. But yeah, so we, I, I don't mean to take anything away from from uh, tissue-specific changes that are occurring later in development, but I, I merely was making the point that with that metastable epithelials are very attractive from a uh, from a human, uh, epi, you know, epi, epigenetic epidemiologic perspective because of the fact that you know many people have these these uh, case control um, cohorts set up where they've collected peripheral blood DNA and, and studied, you know, things from a gene genetic perspective, and they're interested in studying uh, similar associations from an epigenetic perspective as well. So I think when we catalog more of these uh, of these metastable epithelials, that will give us you know, the ability to do that, to take peripheral blood DNA samples uh, and then infer the epigenetic state in, in you know certain tissues that are of most of, of greatest pathophysiological relevance to a specific disease of interest, and and, and, and that's the that's the real focus. Yes. Uh, I'm curious. Do you know if the methylation patterns on reset every generation, or can some of them be from say the mother, the maternal cell? Yeah, of course there there is. Um, you know, when when I was talking about that. That timeline of how methylation is, you know, mostly erased from the sperm and the egg genome, uh, it's, it's not all erased. Uh, so there are certain regions of the genome that are protected from this from this erasure. And and the best example is to think of is genomically imprinted genes. There are there are a, you know a small subset of genes in in your genome where which which are expressed preferentially from the allele that you inherit from your father or from your mother, and uh, that. That tagging is achieved by uh, by allele-specific methylation marks that are in the in the sperm or the egg genome and are maintained, uh, you know, past that 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 period of erasure. So you know, so that that's one you know key example of transgenerational epigenetic inheritance, uh, and and there you know there are some others as well. So I guess my follow-up is: Are you able to separate imprinted genes versus those that are Games yeah, that, that's actually a really good question. We're, I mean, we, I didn't talk about it today, but we've, um, we've recently completed a, a, a genome-wide screen for metastable epithelials. We, we did uh, genome-wide bisulfite sequencing in, uh, in two individuals, uh, two tissues from each individual, and, and from that, we've now identified. Uh, you know, depending on what what filtering you apply, either from from several thousand to several hundred. Uh, new metastable epithelials, and one one of the things we're finding is that we do see some links with uh, both with genomic genomic imprinting, and also with uh, allele specific methylation in general. So we're uh, we're trying to, to work out uh, exactly what those connections are. Do you have another kind of technical question? Sure. So I, I know that one of the criticisms of bisulfite sequencing is that you can differentiate between hydroxy methyl and regular methyl. Do you have a sense for how that might impact your work, or is there anything you can actually? Is it is it really an important thing? Yeah, I mean, it, um, the hydroxymethylcytosine is you know um, is most prominent as a uh, it's on the pathway to TET mediated uh, active demethylation of DNA. So the the highest levels of 5-hydroxymethylcytosine. Are uh, in certain regions of the brain, in, in certain in neurons, and, and also in the in the in the developing germline. Um, but so in that in the, the tissues that we've looked at, and, and even there, you have you know maybe only like a couple a couple percent of overall um, DNA methylation is is five hydroxy. So it's, it's certainly not a major form of, of DNA methylation. And uh, in the tissues that we mainly focus on, like peripheral blood and 
and liver, kidney, that sort of thing, it's, uh, it should be negligible. But yeah, so that, it's, a, it's a good point though, that, that um, there's a lot of interest in 5-hydroxy methylation and whether it is uh, really acting as an epigenetic mark. And my, my understanding is that, that, that it's not been shown yet that it is actually serving as an epigenetic mark itself, but rather it's just an intermediate on the pathway to demethylation. One last question. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, do you think methionine deficiency itself can induce hypomethylation? I'm sorry, can you say that again? Methionine itself. Uh, methionine. Okay. Do you think methionine itself can induce hypomethylation? Methionine deficiency itself, right? Um, Let's say you have know, adequate eating folate and vitamin C, but you're just deficient in your Yeah, it, it's a funny thing. Um, I've, when, when, when I was a, uh, a postdoc with, with Randy Jordal and, and also in, you know, sub subsequently after starting my own lab, we, we did some studies trying to, you know, so all of our work has been looking at supplementation and, and showing increases in methylation. Uh, where, you know, we, and we, we tried to do some work with, you know, various deficiency models and, and trying to, uh, you know, induce reductions in methylation. And actually, in most cases, what we found is kind of um, counterintuitive increases in methylation. Uh, there as well. So it's almost like there's uh, compensatory uh, mechanisms that kick in and actually overshoot and, and can cause more methylation when you're trying to uh, induce hypomethylation. So uh, it's, uh, I, would, I would say that I, I haven't seen any examples specifically looking at methionine deficiency alone, um, but uh, that I would, just, I would just give that caveat that for some reason, um, you know, it, it's not as easy to induce hypomethylation as it is hypermethylation. From, from nutrition, from a from nutritional manipulation. Okay, well, let's thank Dr. Warren. And students, of course, can meet.